Uh, we are back. My first guest tonight is the senior political analyst for CNN and the co-host of its news magazine, CNN and Time. Please welcome Jeff Greenfield. I've Interesting been seeing, uh, interview you had there. Yeah, I don't know how you can't score these great interviews. I just think it's, you know, you got great demographics. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, I can get all the big people in here. Very impressed. Uh, this is, uh, first of all, we've all been seeing a lot of you, you know? Entirely too much. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, it, it, first of all, uh, I remember when you first came here, which was way back in 1993, mm -hmm. you were on the show. Yep. And, and President Clinton was not too far into his first term. And you made a prediction about President Clinton. I did. I said he's the first baby boomer president. And what will be interesting is that if he screws up, it will be in ways no other president ever has. Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> that was pretty amazing. Uh, that was a great prediction. It was. A, uh, and you it, said he'd uh, be involved with an intern named no, no, Monica wait a second. Kablinski. Uh, okay. You were close. I got it so close. <laughs> yeah. Not good enough. No. I, I thought it was pretty impressive, though. You, um, do you have any predictions? For, for George W. Bush as president. Do you, do you believe, is there anything that you as a, an experienced newsman can tell us? Yeah, I think that you and your late night comedians have done him the biggest favor anybody could do, which is that, that you remember when Clinton did get into that situation. Right. One of the reasons he survived was you and everybody else had, what had you said about Clinton for years? That he's a good, honorable man no. and we should get behind him. No, that he would go after pretty oh, much right. anything in sports. <laughs> yeah. So when he got caught with a portion of his clothing, in disarray. What mm -hmm. did the country say? We're shocked? They said, well, we knew that. Conan, Conan told, told us told this us. would happen. All right. Now, what are you even saying about George W. Bush for the last year? He's a good, honorable man, no. and we should get behind him. No. no. You basically, you're saying this man could not organize a two-car funeral. <laughs> uh, That's good. So, uh, <laughs> so, if George W. Bush gets up and utters, say, a couple of three-syllable words, the country's going to say, wow, much more impressive than Conan told us. Good God. I didn't realize I had this kind of impact. Enormous. Uh, I think you're very deluded. Uh, <laughs> but what I, what I did notice about the debates was that you had heard so much about Gore is a very good debater, and uh, Bush's own people were saying he has trouble putting his pants on. And so when he showed up and his pants were on, and he actually stood there and answered some questions, he went way up in the polls. He himself has said that one of his greatest assets throughout his political career is that he is always underestimated. And so when he ran against Ann Richards, no chance. She's a popular governor. Who's this guy? Owns a baseball club. Right. Uh, that's right. George W. Bush, who has, he is cognitively challenged, it seems, at times, with words. That's such a nice way of and, saying uh, dumbass, you know? It's just... <laughs> But he's not. You see, that look. Right, right. He's so dumb, he's about to be president. You know, that's... that's well, he the... had a little help. You know, if my dad was president and gave me a ball club, you know, I'd... I'd, I'd no, might wouldn't. be a late-night host. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I wouldn't exactly. be president, is what you're saying. What I, that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm sorry to offend you. But the other thing is, it also turns I out... I think you should go now. Okay. The other thing you're is... You're sitting in that woman's chair, by the way. I, I beg hope. your pardon. Uh, what about Gore's concession speech? What do you think of that? It was eloquent. It was, as we were all saying, gracious. It was not the best concession speech I ever heard, however. Because people were saying it was the best concession speech ever. You think you know a better one? One better. When, when Mo Udall, Congressman Udall, lost a presidential primary in 1976, he said, the people have spoken, the bastards. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just think that's the most... Because I, I don't understand how these guys do this. I right. mean, if I had spent two years of my life and lost, particularly the way Al Gore lost, getting more votes than the other guy, 200 votes in Florida, somewhere in the right. bottom of the Everglades, maybe people couldn't figure <laughs> right. out how to vote, I'd get up and I'd say, so because of this, instead of me flying in a 747, I'm going to be teaching at an Ivy League school and going on cable television. And I would really be enormously annoyed. But so the, he managed to pull it off. He did. He seemed very gracious. He did. I, yeah. now, now, one of the things all of us notice at times of a national crisis is that the news media, especially CNN, has to fill a lot of time. You've noticed this. You guys are out there, and you I'm sure there's someone there saying, just do another two hours. What do you think is the most ridiculous time filler it, that, that, that you've noticed in this whole crisis? I think there's no question. It was the driving of the ballots in that truck up to Tallahassee. <laughs> um, yeah, there's just... 
It's hands down the winner because what happened is you, some of the stuff you know. I don't. Your writers must take the day off when they say something like that because you, you can't be. Them. That's that's actually we get upset when something like that happens because you look at it and you go, okay, let's do something funny about this. Funnier than that, you can't. No. You can't top what really happened. Here we are. There's live helicopter coverage, right? And then because we're taking a picture of it, it has to be important, right? Mm -hmm. So you have some of my contemporaries, no names, please, who treat it like the Hindenburg disaster. It's like. Okay, the truck is being driven by John Smithers. He's 41. He has two children, and Kelly is a cheerleader. They're pulling into the Stuckies. I believe, yes, he's about to order lunch. Get it, Scotty. Get it, Scotty. He's ordering a cheeseburger. What is that? Fries or an onion ring? It's an onion ring. You heard it here first. Like, come on. You know, give me and a you, and, and, so, and you have to keep talking about it. Oh, well, then we run it in slow-mo. <laughs> Let's see that truck Let's again. Let's see that truck again. You'll notice he's executed a fine K-turn. Uh, it, it, it's what happens when you have 24 hours to fill, and I think you also saw it the night the Supreme Court decision was announced, when they go to a That was hilarious. That was brilliant. You guys, you beat us again. You were funnier than us. Because that decision came out, and they had to interpret it, and they couldn't. It and was almost like an Olympic event. Here, it's 20 degrees, you're freezing your various body parts off. Here is an incredibly complicated 60-page Supreme Court decision with a lot of Latin in it. Tell us what it means now! One poor guy, I think, figured he was reading the warranty on his uh, VCR for five minutes. Uh, it says, I kept it, it I says kept here that I'm supposed to program by... I kept expecting people just to start crying. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> correspondence just to break down crying when that happened. Well, it, it, it's, the, it's the point where you want to say to the anchor, leave me alone for five minutes, and television won't let you do that. That's the thing about instant news. Television is about constantly ah. pleasing, constantly feeding the beast. You can never stop. It's driven me to madness. Uh, oh. You've noticed that, have you? Uh, what is Clinton going to do before we go? In what, what sense do you, what do you, do you mean that? <laughs> well, what do, you think, what, we, what do you think President Clinton will do once he... Everyone speculates uh, that he's, you know, he's going to teach, he's going to spend, hang out at his library. What do you think President Clinton's going to do? Seriously, look, this is the... Except for Teddy Roosevelt, this is the youngest ex-president we have ever had. He, I think he craves action. He craves... Of, of all kinds. But what I mean is... I, mean, I think it's one of the reasons they're coming Get to Get off my York. turf here, pal. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I think that he will try to emulate Jimmy Carter in, in making himself a presence in international stuff, trying to solve crises. I actually think, nobody else agrees with me about this, so I might be right, that he might have wanted to be a Supreme Court justice because he, he taught law, and we've had one ex-president do it. The only problem is he's facing disbarment proceedings right now. Um, <laughs> a so small little a small hitch. little problem. Uh, you don't Congress really need Senate. a law degree to be Supreme Court you don't, justice. You know. That's apparent now. You can uh, make it. <laughs> yeah. See something I can do. The, uh, the 1995 <laughs> novel, The People's Choice, uh, has been reissued, is in bookstores right now. Because it's about the Electoral College going bluey. Who knew? I'm pretty good at predictions, it turns out. But I'm scared that you're... What's your next book? It's about a late-night comedian who wreaks havoc upon the entire <laughs> okay. civilized world. A carrot-topped quipster. All right. <laughs> Jeff Greenfield, thank you very much. Pleasure. Always good to have you here. Jerry Ryan coming up. We'll take a break. We'll be right back.